Hey everybody, I'm Zoe. And I'm Chandi. And welcome back to Bound by the Cloak. Navigating the music industry can be difficult. From singing to songwriting and even producing, some are able to break through while others struggle to get their voices heard. It takes persistence, perseverance, and a whole lot of heart. Today, we're speaking with Ariel Lask, a singer-songwriter, as well as a producer and co-host of the podcast Breaking Through, which she hosts with Twinny, which can be found on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So we caught up with Ariel to learn more about her journey of navigating the music industry, the ups and downs that she's faced, and also where she's at now in her career. Ariel is sharing her own personal perspective and opinions and wants the listener to know that what she is sharing is based off of her own lived experience. All right, so we're here with Ariel Lask. Ariel, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. I'm Ariel. I'm a songwriter and musician. Um, I live out in Los Angeles now, but I've kind of hopped all over the place. Finally putting down roots. Uh, But yeah, I don't like labels, you know, because we can become anything throughout our lives. But right now that's the world that I live in and have lived in for, well, actually September will be my 17th year in the industry. I wow, started yeah, I gonna, at 18. I was going to ask you how long you've actually yeah, been in the industry. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's Makes me feel really so time. old. <laughs> yeah, I was going to no, say you started to... when you were two. <laughs> no. <laughs> no um, I, uh, <laughs> I started when I was 18. I'm turning 35. So no. been a long time. So where did your passion for music stem from? I don't know. I think I always had it. Like I remember some of my first memories are like pretending I know the words to songs in a car <laughs> with my mom. Like I always knew the melody right away. I would just make up the words. And my mom would always be like, do you know this song? And I'd be like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I like didn't, but yes. I just love music and I always loved music. And so it just, I don't, I don't know. Some things are just unconscious to people, you know? Like I, I didn't really choose music. I just kind of always liked it, but I actually didn't know I could sing until much later. I just never, no one ever said anything about voices to me, you know, and there were no singers in my house. So we weren't like a singing family. Some people are, I don't know, those like Von Trapp families where they're like (laughs) harmonizing with each other and like having bonfires together. We were not that family, you know, I had like a science family. So no one was like, oh, you have a good voice. So I didn't, I didn't know I could sing until I was like in summer camp when I was like, I don't know. I had to be like in elementary school, but I can't remember what age. And I had a solo and I still have no conscious memory of like, of, I can't tell you the song I sang or how it felt or how anyone reacted. I just remember the people when we were rehearsing being like, wow, you can sing. And I was just like, I can and then that's when I started to pay attention to it. But uh, I didn't like have anyone say you should do something with this until eighth grade. Wow. My, my music teacher was like, you should do, you should study voice. And I said, okay. So is that what you did? Uh, yeah, like loosely, but uh, you know, you can't, you shouldn't train your voice that young. Cause you can actually hurt yourself. Oh, wow. I mean, uh, I'm sure some vocal coaches would disagree because there are obviously children on Broadway and there's whatever, but it is, there is something to letting your voice naturally develop and then kind of training it. Once you're in a more mature place, it's going to change anyway with puberty. So I just, yeah, I'm sure that there are healthy techniques. I, I was not exposed to those kind of teachers. So my vocal coach was, Basically, let me teach you like breath control or to not like sing too hard, you know, don't like scrut, like squelch, whatever that word is, you know, like, uh, 
but they, there was no formal training until I was like, uh, 15 or 16. But then I got vocal cord nodules and I was told I was probably never going to sing again. And I had to go through like years of vocal therapy. Wow. I, I actually lost most of my range. I used to be able to sing like the lowest note and the highest note. And I, uh, it took me like, um, I don't know, eight, nine years to be able to fully sing like a, a decent range again. Wow. That's crazy. How does that happen? How do you, how does that develop? Overuse of the voice. I also like started smoking pot. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I was like one of those teenagers that like just really loved smoking weed with my friends and obviously it wasn't like cool or legal back then. So we were like, you know, but yeah, and just didn't help. You know, I was singing all the time and then I was smoking pot and it, I think the combination just, you know, I don't have also for better words, like I have vocal cords that are prone to it. So some people have really strong anatomy. I don't. And that's okay. Cause I do have a strong voice when it's healthy. So, but you know, I think that, um, it was like, it's the reason I became a songwriter. Cause I don't think I would have gone down the path I went down if I had not had the nodules. My dad, like, um, they really did think I was never going to get my voice back. That's how bad the nodules were. And surgery wasn't an option because it was just too expensive. And it wasn't, the risk wasn't worth it. It was like such a high risk that it wouldn't work. Um, my dad got me a guitar and he was like, if you can't sing, you have to find somewhere, something else to express through. And so for years, I just played guitar and I wrote songs in my head until I could sing again. And yeah. that's pretty amazing that, you know, in eighth grade, that's when a teacher was like, you know, you have something. So mm -hmm. how did that make you feel? How was that experience for you? I didn't believe him. You know, like I wasn't like a... I, I didn't like know how to take praise or compliments until much later in my life. And, um, I still struggle with it, but I just didn't feel like there's a way that I was special. There was, you know, there's always that one star in every class and I wasn't that star. There was a girl who was already like had every leading role and like, everyone was like, Oh my God, so-and-so she's the star of our grade. So for me, I was like, well, I'm not her. So it didn't, um, it didn't really register for me and I didn't take him seriously, but I knew I loved to sing. So, but I also like wanted to be in the music theater world at that time. And then I remember my mom took me to audition for regional theater and I just knew immediately just like deep inside myself that that was not a world I belonged in because the audition, even for like kids, these kids were so emotionally wrapped up and if they were going to get this play or not. And they had these professional headshots and resumes and like, you know, they were in professional like audition outfits with like perfect like jazz shoes. And I like showed up in like a t-shirt and jeans and like <laughs> whatever, like, I had, didn't have a headshot. I didn't even know you, what a headshot was. And I just thought, I'm never going to care about it that much. I'm never going to want that that bad. And so then I was like, I'm not going to take up space in a place I know I don't want to be. Well, at that point, it could have been the parents, right? The parents yes. kind of like pushing it on their kids. Whereas for you, it was different. You didn't grow up in a musical family, but it seems no. like your parents were still really supportive. And they were tried, you know, to fuel your passion. In, in, they were in good ways. about that. Yeah, they like. Oh, they like helped us test out a lot of different things to see what we liked, and they never made us like stay in something if we hated it. But you know, I, I did like to be in front of people. Like I was a cheerleader from when I was like three until I was in high school, and it wasn't even about being a cheerleader because I honestly I none of those girls liked me on that team. Like I was not popular and I was not cool. They were, you know, there I've like come to realize like they, they weren't like, there, there's no reason to like be upset about someone not wanting to be your friend. 
and you know, it's hard at that time. But anyway, like I, my mom always used to be like, do you want to quit? Like, are you sure you like this? Because literally none of the girls, like none, none of them were my friend. Like, I had a couple of friends on the team, but we were all like the the ones that weren't invited to any parties and whatever. Aww. And I was always like, I love it though. Like there's something about getting a crowd excited. And it should have been like an aha moment for me. of like, you're going to want to perform one day. Because I just loved being in front of the crowd. I loved watch. I love sports. So I love being able to watch football on the like field line. That was the best. But, you know, like, anyway, my parents, they, like, they constantly checked in and were like, are you still happy? That's really so good. It was lucky. Yeah. Lucky. Say, that's really important because, you know, that, that helps you, that helps the parent understand, like, is my kid, you know, really, really interested in this? Or are they just doing it yeah. for other reasons? Are they, are they doing it because they think I want them to do it or, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, they were really, I got very lucky. I always say in life, like, um, especially when it comes to like privilege, I think the greatest privilege in the world is having unconditional support and, uh, and like, especially like emotional support. Because if you're going towards anything challenging and you don't have anyone in your corner saying you should push through or like, we, we know you can do this. Like I've always had that two voices to back me when I was starting to doubt myself. That's like, I mean, I are your cheerleaders. Yeah. I wouldn't have made it without that, honestly, because the music industry is designed to strip you to the down to the bone, right? They don't care about you. They care about what you can give them. So they don't care if they destroy you in the process. If you don't have somebody who's reminding you to build yourself back up or like that maybe something's not right for you or whatever, if you don't have that, there's like two ways. You either have that or you have a lot of money, right? You can't make it in the industry without either a lot of money or someone being like, keep going. <laughs> you can do this. And also, I always had a place to go. I was never going to be homeless. So I was able to take risks because if I messed up royally, I could rebuild my life and just like move back in with my parents for a few months, right. you know? And I, well, while they couldn't financially support me, that is huge. Yeah. Because that is a way of financially supporting someone, even if you're not handing someone money. I didn't have to worry about rent in that time or food or any of that. And like, and so, yeah, my parents are, they're, they're all, for all the flaws that everyone has in their life. And there were obviously things growing up that could have been like better or different or whatever, but I have good parents who never shamed me for failing ever. And that's, that's important. Yeah. super valuable because, because if you're not a trust fund baby, you're probably not going to stay in the music industry long enough to make it. So you've got to have a support system. And you can. There's tons of people who aren't trust fund babies that make it. But I would bet if you go through their history, they have a lot of support. Speaking of the music industry, right? Uh, how did you, how did you, when did you decide to get into the music industry? And, and mm. what was that process? But here, okay, so it's interesting because like I never thought about it. Yeah, how do I say this? Um, I'm, uh, it's always been for me and about me. Like I've never thought about an industry and I've never made music for other people. And I know that sounds like really bad. Like a lot of people are like, I make music to make people feel whole or seen. No, and it's like, I, I want that, that for people. Like that's super cool. Like if you feel that way, amazing. But I make this music for me because oh, I that's... like can't function as a human if I don't do it. That's and so yeah. I never like entered the industry. I just knew I wanted to make music and I was only competing with myself because I, because I had this, like I lost it by the way, and I'm gaining it back now. But for 14 of the 17 years, I was like psychotically, um, like it was like almost like too confident in myself. Okay. I really believed for those 14 years that there was no one like me and that I, it, it, I needed to do this, right? So like there was no humility in it. And I wasn't mean about it. I didn't think I was better than somebody else. I just thought there is no other me. When people would compare my music to something, I'd be like, that doesn't resonate. <laughs> and just be like, no, it's just me. And it was so like... I don't know, blind. Like I was blind for 14 years to the fact that like 
you know, I was probably cockier. Not co- I was never cocky, but I was probably like a little too confident. I get that, yeah. But then you're always humbled, right? So humility came for me hard. <laughs> but I never entered the industry. I never like, I never had a goal. I never had a aim for like a record label or anything like that. I never, I only cared about like uh, gaining an audience. And that started at 17. I moved to New York City when I was just shy of 18, but I auditioned for singer songwriter sessions at 17 and I made it in and I started playing like CBGB, uh, Bitter End. There was a couple other venues that they did. Just like, it was like a showcase every month. That's and cool. And it was cool. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Half so, those venues don't exist anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, a CBGB. Yeah. Um. So, like the trajectory, right? Of of like you know you kind of beginning to put yourself out there to like you know where you are now. Like, mm. I guess through that time, you know when you just start beginning, you know, like I guess you also mentioned it before. We're saying like you know you, not cocky, but you know you you thought you know you were so different and so unique, right? And special than, than, than other artists, right? Like you have this thing, right? That, that other yeah. people don't have. I think everybody feels that way. They all like, have to, you have to. Yeah. 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 And like, so how does that changed from like that beginning mm-hmm. to like, to like now? I mean, it's been a long time, but. I would say that like the root thing that changed is for the first 14 years, there was never a second of my life that I thought I would not make it. Like I always thought I was going to make it. I really was like, there's just no way I won't. And then a bunch of stuff like dissolved all at once. I had this like, I had like the dream record deal on the line. I had management and everything just like went all of a sudden out of nowhere. And at and and it was devastating, but it was at the time it was like blamed on my appearance. They were like, basically the sentence that was said to me was, um, you're the voice we wait our entire career for. It's literally one in a million. But when we open our eyes, you just don't look the part. And I've been called like fat before or like not beautiful enough in the industry many times. And I don't know what it was about this time, but I think it's like, you know, women, we go through a lot with our bodies and like most women have faced some type of like assault or abuse. I did. And I think it was like the first time in my life that my body was weaponized against me again you know, and in a different way. Cause it's like, when it's like sexual abuse or assault, it's like totally out of your hands. There's nothing that you can do about it. When it's be of what you look like and your body's being weaponized, it's like, could I have changed? Should I change myself? Could I have changed? It's like a whole different layer of just devastation. It turns out like later that I found out that the company was like doing a lot of fraudulent stuff and they just wanted to like cut ties. And the easiest way to get me to like go quietly was to blame it on me. Right. Instead of what they had done, it was what, so it was just, you know, what it was. But I, that changed the trajectory of my career because. Up until then, I only wanted to be an artist. I did not want to write for other people. Um, I was like, I did write for other people when I lived in Nashville. That was country music. So it's like, it was like separate in my brain. And I didn't like start professionally songwriting until I was 27. So almost a decade into my career. So I really, but when I, when this all happened, I completely stopped being an artist which was shocking. Like I never thought that I would do that. And I, I was just focusing on songwriting. And then 2019, I moved to LA. Like I was asked to be part of this like song camp, which is like when you get together with a bunch of writers and producers and write for a specific project. And so I didn't have any money really left because I, I had like moved to London and I blew all my savings. So when I came back from London, I had nothing left. 
financially. And I only had enough to get a plane ticket to LA. I didn't have enough for a return ticket. So I decided to just move there because I was like, I don't want to miss this opportunity, but I also can't afford to come back. So let's just move. And after the song camp, like even though that camp was great, I just couldn't, I just was so terribly depressed and heartbroken that I was like, I don't know if I want to do this at all anymore. So I decided to just get a real day job again and just quit the industry. And so I quit songwriting and I quit being an artist. And I, for a couple months, like I just was like building my life of who I am outside of music. But then I got offered a publishing deal. So I like, I don't know, the surrender kind of gave me time to like not be hyper-focused on anything. And that's how it started back up again was, you know, being with the publisher and starting to write just to write again. I still didn't want anything to do with being an artist. And, uh, and then it was just like a slow build back from there. That it's still a long road. No, I mean that just makes me so mad that the company essentially gaslit you. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not sure if what they said was the absolute major reason why you, you know, had doubts, but it seems like it was a pretty big reason. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think like. At the time I was, I had just turned 30. I think that's when it happened. Time is so weird now since the pandemic. Like, I just feel like I don't know, have a grasp on when anything happened. But uh, I had just turned 30. And when this happened, and I remember like moving to London and being like, if this isn't it, I don't know if I want to keep trying. So I was like already on the edge of like, being tired of it. And I always used to say to people, it's like, there comes a point in everyone's career in music where you've done so much, you've tried so hard and anybody would respect you if you walked away. They wouldn't think of you as a quitter. And if you just stay a little longer, that's usually when it breaks. And so I was always like waiting for the stay a little longer to work out. But when this happened, I just was like, I don't think... I can start again because it was like I would have had to start from what I thought was zero again. And I just didn't want to do it again. So, but, you know, and again, and I owe it to my parents because I didn't go home right away. I like ended up coming back to Nashville and like for probably six months, I was just trying to like write as much as I could so that I wouldn't think about what I lost. And my older brother, who's like not a emotional person, he's like not a, like a very like feelings kind of guy, um, called me and was like, you're not well. You need to come home and you need to heal because you're not well. And I've never heard him use the word heal. <laughs> and, and, uh, and for my brother who doesn't do like feely things to be like, you're not well. I was like, I must be really, really unwell. If my older brother is being like, you need help, you need help. So I like, that's when I went back to New York and it got really bad. Like I, my hair was falling out. I wasn't eating. I was like in bed so much that my muscles were like starting to like get really weak. And my dad gave me this book called Relentless, which do you guys know um, who Tim Grover is? No. He's a condition. He's like a coach for for athletes. He he like um does mental and physical conditioning for them. And and I'm a big sports fan. He like trained Michael Jordan and like a bunch of big greats in the NBA. Anyway, he wrote a book, Relentless. And my dad was like, read the first chapter. If you hate it, you could toss it at my head. And it was something about that book that woke me back up because the book basically says like there are three types of people. There's the there's like um I think the the bottom one is like coolers. I think it's cooler. I'm not sure. I didn't pay attention to that one because I'm not that. Um, but it was like closers and cleaners. And cleaners are basically people who are competing with themselves, who uh, are relentlessly pursuing the best that they could be. You know, just like there's a relentless pursuit of something. And that's who I am. And there was something about like one being known that well by my father, 
woke me back up. Reading who I am, like seeing it on a paper and what I'm capable of. And in the book, it talks about how cleaners will break. You have to, you cannot be 100% all the time. And you cannot win all the time. And I, I think seeing permission to break, and that doesn't mean you're not a cleaner. It just woke me back up. But I, anyway, that all happened right before LA, but I was still super depressed when I moved to LA. So I still needed the break from the industry. I don't know why I went on that tangent. I cannot remember no, I mean, the it's, it's, it's actually <laughs> interesting because like my question like with that was going to be, you know, how did your, your family... Like, you, you know, you mentioned your brother saying that, you know, you, you, you needed to heal. And I was going to ask like yeah. what they did, you know, to help you. Because like they, if they noticed mm-hmm. that something was up, you know. They really didn't do much because like, not that they didn't do much. They left, they gave me like space to be okay. Yeah. And like, we never talked about it though. Okay. You know, my parents just wanted me to like stabilize. I grew up in like a house with very like literal thinkers, you know, everyone's in science or finance. So it's like, which is actually not true. My brothers are, they actually own an entertainment company and they're like DJs and they own, they like do events all over. It's like, they're amazing and they are musical, but it's different kind of industry. It's still very business focused. So when I say finance, I mean like they have business brains and they're also wildly creative. Like my dad is an amazing guitar player. My mom's a poet, but they don't share their gifts. They just, it's for them. So we never collaborated with anything. But wow. so we didn't, we didn't like talk about it, but my parents, they always were like, I was never a starving artist. I always had jobs. I had three jobs when I lived in New York city. I had two jobs when I lived in Nashville. I never didn't work. And so my parents were like, just start working, build, build your money back up and then go back out and do it again. You know? So it wasn't really a like, Hey, you need to heal. It was like, Hey, rest up, replenish your bank account and then get out. <laughs> But that, but that is helping. I mean, because they're, yeah, they're telling, yeah, I mean, they're, they're yeah. definitely still helping you. Yeah. For sure. It's just not like a, let's talk about our feelings and what do you know? That, it's oh, just, no, yeah. that was not in my family. We did not do that. <laughs> Mine doesn't do that either. Yeah. Let's light some candles. Right, right. Nope. There were no healing crystals in my house. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But it was good. You know, I'm very lucky. I don't, I would definitely not be in the industry right now if it weren't for my family because I would have had to quit the first time. You know, it wasn't, London was not the first time that things fell apart. And it wasn't the first time I had to start over. It was just the first time it broke me. So, so I, you know, let's talk about that, um, which you did mention, you know, throughout the conversation, you know, the different struggles you've had, but um, specifically, like, you know, what are the struggles and your highlights that you've mm. experienced in your journey? I, you know, I would say as like a performer in, in New York, I didn't struggle too much because it was a very steady climb in New York. Um, I got, I don't want to say luck because I worked my ass off, but I, I, um, I was never satisfied with what I had. I was always working towards the next goal. So I think the struggle during that time between like ages 18 and like 27 were really like exhaustion and and like not taking care of myself because I would get up for work at like 6 a.m. I would be at work by like 8 and then work until 7 eat something, go to a venue, either play a show or network until midnight, 1am and then do it all again. So I wasn't getting a lot of sleep and I was like, I had no social life. I had uh, no romantic life. I just worked and played and worked and played. And so I think like um, that was probably the most unhealthy time of my life. And so that's a struggle in itself. Like you cannot do your best if you're half of a person. But I, I didn't know that then. But I didn't struggle with self-esteem back, back then. And I didn't struggle to get gigs. I always had gigs. Um, I was never nervous to play a show. I just was always nervous if enough people would be in the room to satisfy the booking agent. You know? 
That was my only stress during that time. That's all I ever cared about. Will enough people show up? And so that was a different chapter, but I knew that I wouldn't make it the way I wanted to if I'd stayed in New York because you could become a hometown hero. You could play Bowery Ballroom packed out and never be able to bring five people to a show anywhere else. And so there's like this false sense of success in New York. And I knew we were starting to get back to that because we were playing, my bands and I were playing like Mercury Lounge and it would be sold out. But you only get to play like the Bowery Presents Clubs every couple months. So I knew that once I, once, once we like started playing Mercury Lounge, I was just like, I've reached my peak here because I'm, if the only next one for me on this level is Bowery Ballroom, that's going to take years to get to. and if I'm opening for like Terminal 5 or things like that, then I'll, I'll have to have been touring or with a book. Like, I knew. I knew the business side of it. And I was like, we got to get out. So the first like real hurdle was that my band, you know, they were hired guns at the end of the day. Like we played together for almost a decade, but they were still playing with other people and they weren't dead. It was my project. It was just me. And I told them I want to move to Nashville. Does anyone want to take a leap of faith with me? And they didn't want to. And that was like first really big heartbreak for me. I didn't blame them there. They made their bread and butter on gigging three times a night, you know, and they would have had to like take a financial hit and a huge risk. So of course they were going to say no, obviously. But when you're young and you like love your band so much and you really believe what you can do together and they're, they don't believe they don't like I, at the time I internalized it, if I was better, then they would take the risk with me because they clearly don't think I can make it. That That's not true. But that's how I internalized it. So like I moved to Nashville. That was like the first big heartbreak for me. And then Nashville brought a lot of heartbreak because it was the first time I was pursuing being a songwriter and I knew nothing about that world. And, it, and it's a boys club. And so... Then I went through many no's, like the more no's than I've ever heard in my life in Nashville. It was just no after no after no. But it was like a game for me. Then it became fun because I was just like, okay, if they're going to say no, I'll just show them what yes looks like, you know? And so, (laughs) (laughs) and I had, I had a pretty much a great run in Nashville. I had one very almost like uh, signing with a major publisher and it was so close. I could like taste it. And uh, at the end of the day, the, the head of the a and pulled me aside and she was like, off the record, we're not signing women. What? Mm-hmm. And she was like, and she was like, it's not um, my choice. I, w- I, I obviously want to sign women. But that is from the top. They just want male perspective right now. And I was like... So what? it was rigged from the beginning. Oh, yeah. Wow. I was never getting the deal. And this is country music. It's Nashville. Well, right? they don't get they, country music. Nashville is like, it's men. I mean, yeah. at, you can, at any time, there's never more than three women on country radio. That's the thing. I, I was just thinking about it. Like, honestly, yeah. the majority. Yeah. 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 Wow. And I love Nashville and I love country music. And I have a hope for the future of country music to be much, much more um, diverse than it is now. Yeah. Not just men, women, but like racially also, there's like a lot of amazing people of color who are making country music and they're just now getting a chance to break through, which is awesome, you know? Um, But when I lived in Nashville, that was not the Nashville I lived in. So if you were anybody but a straight white man, it was going to be really, really hard for you. Because half of the thing in the music industry is like the hang. I should have said that from the start. It's like the yeah. most important thing is, can you hang? Yeah. And that doesn't mean you have to drink and do drugs. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you cool to be around? And like, what does that fucking mean? Like, that's so hard to say who's cool to be around because it's all about your personal taste. But it's a little club in the music industry. And if people don't want to hang out with you, that's it you're probably not going to get very far. So 90% of your time is going to be spent hanging out, networking, but you're not networking because you're just hanging and learning to stop networking and just hang. 
So it's about image in, in a sense, like it you is, know, you know, how the music industry works. Like, you know, do you look marketable? Do you, do you yeah. look like you fit in with, you know, everyone that's and everything? dead now. That's dead now yeah. because we don't live in that industry anymore. The industry I yeah. came up in doesn't exist anymore. That's I don't true. know what the new thing is. I'm already in, like, I, not that I'm, I'm not like wildly successful, but I'm already in, right? Like once you're right. in the matrix of it, I don't have to worry about that beginning part anymore. Like now I'm, now I'm like rising in a different way. It's through my work. My work gets me through doors now. Yeah. But before your work can get you through doors, you have to get in the door. I have no idea how they do it now. I don't get it. There's like 60,000 songs being uploaded to streaming every day. I don't understand like how you're seen in this world. They're not, we're not hanging out. It's post pandemic. Like the parties aren't what they used to be. The venues aren't as packed as they used to be. People aren't going to showcases like they used to. So I have like no advice for the new age because I don't know how to do, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't even know where to start now. I just know what wow. we did. And it was being at the party, being at the showcase or the, the venue that you think is the hottest venue in town, you know, just always being around is how I, how we did it back in my day, whatever that fucking means. So it's like in many aspects or in many industries, it's who, you know, not necessarily oh, yeah. what you have to offer or yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's unfortunate. Um, but you only need one person to believe in it. That's the thing. Like I, in New York, you know, I don't remember his last name, but the, the, the man who ran singer songwriting sessions was named Larry. Larry changed my life by just letting me into the singer songwriter sessions. I went from never having a single live experience other than one talent show in high school, which I had to beg my way into, by the way. They did not want me to perform in the talent show and I had to beg, but that was the only performance I had ever done. And I auditioned for the singer songwriter sessions and Larry saw something in me. And I went from not performing at all to performing at the most prestigious clubs in New York City. Was it like my own show? No, I got to do three to four songs in a month. Who cares? It changed my life. I learned, I, I met other artists. I, I met my guitar teacher because of it. And my guitar teacher, Josh, his, his name is Josh Walker. I'm actually, I've been trying to find him for years. He like doesn't fucking exist on social media. It's <laughs> killing me. Anyway, I just, he spent hours teaching me how to perform. Wow. How to work with a microphone, how to talk to a crowd, how to talk while you tune, how to tune on stage, how to know when you're in tune without a tuner. This guy like changed my life, right? All these booking agents around the like you just need one booker to believe in you to get into other clubs in New York City or around the world. I had a guy, he was constantly emailing back and forth to me about what I needed to do in order to get onto a booking agency. You know, you just need a couple people to be like, I got you, I got you. In Nashville, this woman, Emma Grandilo, she got me on my first writer's round in Nashville and would constantly like, um, put me on anything she could. And she would, she, uh, the first, there's these thing called briefs when you're doing writing for pitch or when you're writing for sync licensing, you get like a brief of what the company needs. I had never seen one before. She showed me my first pitch sheet, my first brief, you know, you need people who believe in you and you don't need a lot. You only need a couple people and you only need to start with one. So, so I mean, yeah, you, that's really all you need. And it, when you finally got that, uh, publishing deal. Mm -hmm. How was that? It was anticlimactic because I, it was a very short term deal. Like I was signing it because I'm like, I'm like a firm believer. If like a deal is good and the terms are right and it's going to change your current reality, just if there's no risk, go for it. And there was a really low risk deal because it was uh, most deals are exclusive and you're locked in for years. This was like, a non-exclusive deal, which meant if a bigger deal came along, I could dissolve it. Um, and it was a year term. So I really had nothing to lose. Um, but it, I signed it in 
I got offered it in November of 2019 and I signed it January 1st of 2020. And then the pandemic hit. So I never got to see what we could have done together, but they ended up being not the right company for me, which is okay. It just, um, they were based internationally. And because of the pandemic, I couldn't like do anything overseas. And I needed a team that I think had like a different structure. They, they, the way that they do things is very cool. It just wasn't my way of working. So that didn't end up working out. But it was wonderful. You know, it, the, I met a lot of amazing people because of it, and it was worth it. It just wasn't something that was going to continue forward. But it worked out because, you know, what's interesting is like I had my first, my two of the biggest things in my career happened in 2020. I, had, I got the publishing deal, and then I um, had my first song on radio. And, and both were so great, but also very anticlimactic because. You know, no one's driving in their car in, I think it came out in like April, March. March. Yeah, April of 2020 is when the song came out on the radio. Nobody's in their vehicle. Like nobody's like bop into the radio at that time. So it probably would have gone 10 times farther had people, had it come out not when we're all locked in our homes making sourdough bread. It's before the pandemic got dark, you know? Oh man, that's, yeah, that's, that's. That's yeah, ah, no. But it was I'll, fine because like, it's still mine. I yeah. I celebrated the hell out of it. I really of did. Course. And and it, it's huge. It's still huge to be able to say that you had a song on radio and it was international, which is my dream. I I love America wow. good like it's super super cool whatever, but I've always had a goal to break into the UK and Scandinavia. That's and that's still what I'm working towards. Because I just love how they love music what they like to listen to is aligned with what I like to make. So, you know, it was like my first song on radio and it was in the UK. It was on BBC Two, which was so exciting. And it was just a moment, but it could have been an even bigger moment. And so you just got to, I guess, accept like it doesn't always happen the way you think it, but at least it happened. What song was it? It was called Type of Girl with an artist named Twinny. It's a country song, actually. And it's a great song. We wrote it with an awesome uh, producer that's based out of Sweden, Ye Gonzalez. And he, he's amazing. The, the whole song was just a great experience to write. And it was so exciting to hear it on radio. And and everyone loves it when she plays it live. So, you know, it's a, all in all, it's like a great, it was a great moment. Well, you know, with all the things that you've faced and um, the obstacles and the struggles, like, but you're still a positive person. You're a humble person, which, you know, you've said that you weren't always. Right. So how, how have you, I mean, I know how you became more humble is because you were forced to, but how do you stay so positive and optimistic? Mm, I think you're just, I think that like, it's just, uh, I guess it's from my parents, you know, my dad, like, faced a lot of ups and downs in his own career. And he never, I never saw him say it won't get better. He always said, I know it's going to get better. It's going to be probably at this time, but I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to get there. So I had this like model of somebody who is like, uh, we can make it happen. It just might be a different timeline or like, even when we had very little, cause it was very up and down growing up. I never felt like we didn't have anything. So for me, like um, I have a very simple life and I don't need a lot of things to be happy. And my parents really showed me how you can make a little go a very long way. So I think it's easy to stay positive when I'm oh I know I'm okay. Like I realized that when I when I got that, I'll say I've always been a um, like a modest person. Like I never um, shoved my, even though I felt like I was unique and the best and all those things, like my best, right? Even though I thought all those things, like I never shared that with anybody ever. Nobody knew that's how I felt. It was more of like an internal overconfidence that got kind of shattered later on. But, but like, I I realized 
in my 20, like late twenties, like the only person that can tell you it's over is yourself. It's a personal choice. Like, especially nowadays, no one can tell you you can't release a song. Sure. In the 90s, 80s, 90s, anything earlier than like 90s, even the early 2000s. Yeah. You absolutely could be told, sorry, you're not going to put out music because there was a chokehold on who got to actually press a vinyl or, or like make a cassette that wasn't like homemade. So, but we don't live in that world anymore. So literally like I, the only way that I would not be a songwriter or an artist is if I decided I'm not doing it anymore. But, but when you know that, when you know it can't be taken from you, then it's easy to stay positive because I just know now when I'm overwhelmed and I need to rest, I stop and I take a break and I come back to it. But I'm also much gentler now with myself and, and my goals. You can be, this is something I learned the past three years. It's like, you can be relentlessly pursuing something and not be working every second of every day and pounding yourself to pulp. I am relentlessly still pursuing in a very smart way now. And I have more downtime than work time at this point. It's also the first time in my life that I don't need a day job. And that, and that, and if we're talking about 17 years in the industry, only two of those years, I didn't need to support myself somewhere else. This is wild. I mean, that's amazing that, you know, now yeah. like, yeah, it's taken a long time, but you, you've, you've gotten there and that that's, yeah. That's great. But you have to adjust what your idea of success is. Like I happen to now be doing something in the industry, like writing for TV film, which nothing has come out yet. And it'll be like coming out in the next couple of years. But like, I couldn't have cared less about that even three years ago. And like, that was not part of the goal. And that is not how I wanted to make my money in the industry. But you know what? It's awesome and it's fulfilling and it pays me enough to be able to like breathe and not stress and do really good work. And that that is also success. Even if it, even if none of the films and television shows like take the songs, it's still success that you're in the room writing for it. You know? So I think you have to also adjust as you go along. Like uh, I'd say anyone trying to pursue it's like, Sure, you can create a door or you could bust through a wall, but I guarantee if you keep walking the path just a little longer, you'll find a door that's already open for you. And it might not be the one you really, really, really want right now, but just because you walk through that door doesn't mean you can't do the other thing. You know? And also, stop trying to make music your main source of income. It's never going to be consistent. So get something that works for you. If you want to be an artist, get yourself a day job and perform at night. If you want to be a writer, get a bartending job at night and write during the day. You can't chase... Uh, I think Taylor Swift said this, actually. You can't chase three rabbits at once. Pick a rabbit to chase. Catch it. And then you can go get another rabbit. She's smart. Wow. That is good. Though. I like that. Yeah. It's like, so as you said, like right now you're, you're really writing. Um, how has your writing changed over the years? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, cause obviously now you're writing for, for TV and, and film. So is yeah. that different than, than writing for, you know, just for yourself in terms of performing it? Oh yeah. I mean, well, I'm also writing with a lot of artists too. And they actually feel inside my body the exact same. It's like when it's not personal, because it's not for my artist project, I don't overthink it or edit it in any way. Like I just see what needs to be said or done and then do it. And I, and I, I write really fast for TV and film. Like uh, I'll, get, I'll get a brief and just like, I can have a song in 45 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, or less. That's really cool. Um, and sometimes it takes all day. It just depends on the project. But, but with artists, like, writing for another artist. I think people make it really difficult for themselves when they're writing with another artist. They want to prove themselves so bad. But 
I'm going to like, I don't gatekeep. I'm not a gatekeeper. So I'm going to tell the best thing I ever learned. Just like, shut up. Let, <laughs> shut up. Let the artist talk to you. And then let the artist find their melodies. Because you know what? They don't want to sing your melody. That actually makes, yeah. That makes they want to sing their melody. I don't care if you don't like their melody. They like their melody. And They're your job is to make it. their melody better. Yeah. Make They're it the ones singing almost it, so their it. melody. Exactly. No one's going to want to sing a song that, that doesn't feel right to them. Yeah. You could be as strong as you want with the lyrics. Guide them however you want with the lyrics. But they're not going to want to sing your song if they don't like the melody. So shut up. Like, it's so annoying. When I'm in a room and someone's not letting the artist find their melody, I'm aggressive now. I literally say, how about we give so-and-so 20 minutes to play with the melody and see what feels right for them and we can adjust as we go. Because I'm just done wasting time in rooms with people trying to prove themselves when it's like, we're in the room. You don't have to prove yourself. You're here. Let this person find their melody. So it has changed a lot because it's not about me anymore. Right? In the beginning, the first thing I ever said today is like, I never made music for other people. It's just for me. And it's the complete opposite being a writer. I'm helping somebody else make their music and it has nothing to do with me. So in my opinion or taste doesn't really matter in the room, just my ability. I bring my best lyric ability, my best melody ability. And as long as I'm listening to the artist, we're going to get a really good song. If I'm listening to the company, we're going to get a placement because I've listened to exactly what they want and need. And I'm sure they appreciate that because you've been on the other side. And, oh, yeah. And, and so you don't have this ego that your words, you know, that they have to kind of mm-hmm. mold to your needs. It's it's the opposite. That exactly. Word again. And, you know, there are writers who have very distinctive styles. And I can tell when an artist doesn't believe in themselves when they put out a, a song and I could tell you exactly who wrote it with them because I know their style. No one's believing it. You know, the, the and you can see it in the streams and the sales. It's not happening because it's not them. It's the other writer. Mm, that's so it's, and, and honestly, shame on the writer yeah. for dominating the room because they very clearly did. Wow. So like the writer actually... I mean, it seems like it's purposeful, right? Stamps, yeah. puts their stamp on it. Yeah. And it's okay to have distinctive qualities. Like, it's okay to like leave your mark on a song. But there's an artist that just came out with a record. And like, I would say like all about, like if there is, pretending there's 15 songs on the record, probably 12 of them sound like another artist slash writer that did write all the songs with them. And it's like, I could just picture the room and I could see that there was just way too much of that other writer in that room. It's okay to be unique and have people go, I bet so-and-so wrote that song. Like that's something that happens. Julia Michaels is a brilliant writer and I could tell when she's been a part of a song because I can hear the little moment. And I'm like, Oh, that's a Julia Michaels type thing. And I'll look it up and sure enough, she'll be in the, have been in the room. Wow. But but then but that's fine. That's beautiful. We were supposed to. We're still s- creators. Yeah. You know, we still can have a stamp in a room. But I would be super disappointed to hear a song where I was like, she she should be singing that song. Like that would suck <laughs> to hear that. But she's yeah. a great writer, so she's not she's not doing that. You know. Uh, but it happens a lot where you'll just feel like, man. They were trying so hard to be, the artist was trying so hard to be something else. They forgot themselves. And then the streams don't work and the sales don't work because they're just trying so hard to be something else. I think you can tell. I think, yeah, I think you can can tell if you listen hard enough. And, and the public does not miss a beat. Yeah. Like that's something else. Like, I guess if, if anyone's listening that like, um, wants to get into songwriting or music in general, it's like. Uh, there are two kinds of creators. There's creators that create for the public and there's creators that create for musicians. And I'm so sorry to like inform people, <laughs> but people that create for musicians, you're probably not going to have a very 
like massive career. But if you want to be like an arena artist or a radio artist, you got to start making it for the masses and not for the musicians because it's a very different sound and a very different thing. And you can't say that billions of people are wrong about what's good. Like a musician's view of what's good versus the masses view of what's good. It's very different. Dawes, the band, you know? Yeah. They, They are such a good example of a band that makes music that musicians love. Yeah. And they have had massive successes and they have had like sync licensing successes and they have had certain commercial success. But I still put them in that like musicians that make music that musicians love and they can sell out huge venues, huge. And they do the biggest festivals and they're great. And they don't need to write that for the masses. I think if I could put into terms what makes the difference is that most people don't want to get deep into their feels all the time. Music is mostly a escape or a relief for people. That's true. And when you're making music that hits to the core of you, there's not a lot of people that want to experience that all the time. So musicians like that kind of music because we're creating that kind of music. We like to be in our fields. We want to go deep on everything all the time. So we're such miserable people to be around. But no, I'm just kidding. It's fun. But, um, but that's why it's not commercially successful is because people are like, can you give me a break? I just want to like fantasize about dancing on a hot summer night with this like gorgeous person and like touching their body. Can we do that, please? I don't want to feel like how I felt when my grandmother passed away. You know, like it's like, (laughs) I don't want to think about my biggest heartbreak today. Thanks so much, Ray LaMontagne, you know, but I do. I love it, but not everyone does. I was going to say, honestly, I I like music that kind of puts me in my feels more so than just like, you know. (laughs) And you would be someone that falls into that music made for musicians or deep feelers category. And we'll yeah, all be together to in like in like Carnegie Hall crying together, and that's great, you know. Mm-hmm. But Shonda, you're invited if you can. You can you hang? I just want to dance it out, like that's see, what I'm that's, saying. That's, and see, I, I write music for you. I want people to dance, <laughs> like and you drive. guys want to cry. You guys want to like. Just, I want to sit there and analyze the lyrics and the music. Yeah. Oh no. I, as a musician, like as an artist, I make music for people who want to cry. <laughs> and as a songwriter, I make music for people who want to dance and escape and and like lose themselves in like driving or or just hanging out with friends. That's so I get to live in both worlds, but I can't I can't think of like anybody that has done both. Yeah. I really can't. Maybe maybe Billie Eilish and Adele. Mm. you know like Mm. but even if you think about Adele like it's still like such fun music most of the time like her ballads are soul crushing but her up-tempo songs are definitely something you want to like dance to or drive to Billie Eilish is I think really the only sad song person that every song, I can't think of a song that doesn't make you feel something super deep if you like really listen. Like I've never listened to Billie Eilish. Like ever. it's, you know, she's, she's a phenomenon. She totally, she's someone who embodies what I thought that I was. <laughs> it's like super unique, like can't, okay. can't compare her to anything. Like she actually is that. You can't compare Billy to anything. Billy is Billy and everyone's been trying to be Billy for the last like six years. That's interesting. Hmm. You know, speaking of people who want to fit the mold, uh, you know, wanting to be like Billy, do you think you're somebody that fits the typical mold um, in the in the, in the industry? As a writer, I think that I am somebody that can succeed in any room. 
And I I couldn't always say that, but I feel like my skill set and my adaptability and also my compassion for my other creators and just being able to read the room. Like I, I feel like I could succeed in any room and I'm not, I'm not scared of any room. So I guess if there's a mold for what a songwriter should be, I don't know. Is there like, I, I guess I, I think I fit into the songwriting world well. And I have like very good relationships with people. I don't, because I'm not demand. I'm not a very demanding person. I go with the flow. I'm very like big on on like defending my rights as a writer, and I won't just like lay down and take it. But but I definitely think like if there is a mold to fit, that I would probably fit in most in that world. As an artist, I am not the mold, and even to this day, people are like oh, it's different now and image doesn't matter anymore. Who are you talking about? Maybe the consumer doesn't care anymore, but the industry sure does. And I'm too old and too full figured for them to even consider offering me a deal at this point. So I'm not even worried about that mold because it's just like, you know, I don't know yet if I'm ever going to be quote unquote an artist again, but I don't think I ever fit the mold as an artist. I mean, I, I think that that's okay, though. I think that, especially today, the way that a lot of music gets released, which is not by the music industry, you can go yeah. online, post your own music. People will, you know, you'll have followers, you'll have people who listen and love it. My friend's dad, he's like a brilliant songwriter. And he, um, he like shared with us this like wisdom that I, I'll always keep with me. And it's like, your job is to make the the thing, you know, the song or the project, and then you have to let it go entirely because you actually don't have a right to decide what it does. And I loved that because we don't like, even if we decide exactly where it's going to go and what, what it's going to look like, it, we can't control how it's received. So we have no idea what it's going to become. And if you're, you're, you're like grasping at something you'll never touch. So you just have to let it go. And that's what I'm trying to do now. Is like, even if I think it's the best song I've ever written, I have to just let it go. Yeah, it's true. And some things will happen right away and some things are going to happen decades later and you're going to be like, what? Yeah. So just to shift a little bit. Um, so you had a podcast. I do. And I'm still <laughs> editing. The oh, you have? And I just been, okay. Yeah, I have a podcast. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Um, sure. You know, it's about celebrating the small wins. I started it cause like a, a friend of mine, I, I always used to say, I can't wait for my career to start. And my friend would be like, it's like happening right now. Like it has started. <laughs> but my marker of starting was like a success marker that might not ever happen. So that's when I started shifting focus and I, thought of this idea from the podcast to like celebrate the small wins and ask if they celebrated at the time and what were the breakthrough moments. It's called Breaking Through. I actually, the original season was with Twinny and the second season is going to be with her as well. And I think, I don't know what we're going to do moving forward because her tour schedule is crazy. And like, you know, things are, she has like an organization that she runs now. So I'll either continue on on my own or just have two great seasons. But you know, it's a, it's, well, it was really awesome to be able to interview such successful people. We, we kind of touched all different industries. It is music heavy because we're music heavy, but you know, we actually like the second season has a really amazing um, interview with Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics. And if people, Seriously? yeah, and if people, oh, I can't wait for nice. it to come out because wow. if people want to know, really, really know the music industry and really, really understand what it means to just focus on what you're doing, he's the king of that. I mean, like, wow. I learned so much just from that one interview about, and he was somebody that really celebrated every win, you know? So that I'm excited to share that because I think that will be powerful for people. So are you happy? Oh yeah. And I I wasn't 
you know, if we had been having this conversation in like 2019, I would be like, no, I'm miserable. I'm like really happy because I realized like I built a life for myself that no one can take away from me. And, um, I don't know. I I'm, and I'm not, I think that you're either a money motivated person or you're not. And I'm more of like a respect motivated person and, and like, um, prestige motivated person. Money's going to come. I've always felt that money flows very freely if you are not desperate for it. And so there are months when I'm like, okay, let's like see if we skirt by. And there are months that I'm like, this is lush. But (laughs) I think if I, so I think if I was a money motivated person, I'd probably be very stressed out right now. But because I'm like, uh, respect motivated person and like a community motivated person and wanting to be within the community that's going very well for me. So I feel very happy. You know, I'm sure you've had like, I mean, you kind of talked about it a bit, but then we didn't, you know, like go into any more detail about like your podcast and like who you talk to, but like the people that you've met along the way, Mm -hmm. I mean, and even for yourself, um, you know, I'm sure you've had some really interesting experiences along the way. Some of them, I mean, we talked about some of them, but I guess in terms of like meeting people, talking to people, what are like the best or or, or worst or, or strangest or most interesting experiences you've had? Mm. Like specifically to the podcast or just in the career? No, just, just, you know. Hmm. I think like sometimes the, and I'm going to get a little woo woo right now. So sorry <laughs> if people better listening are not spiritual. This is just my life and my beliefs. But I feel like when you're on a path that is meant for you, like sometimes the universe just sprinkles in magic moments to keep you going. And like some of the coolest things that have happened, like I, I used to love this artist. He's like, he started as a blues guy. I was like really into blues when I was growing up. And I, I loved BB King so much. And BB King like um, mentored this guy, Johnny Lang. He's a great blues guy. Um, he, I think he like lives more in like the Christian rock world now, but he was very much like, um, and it's still good. Even as a Jew, I'm like, that's some good shit. Uh, but when I was listening to him, he was just doing more blues and soul music. And, uh, I went to his show with my best friend in high school and we were like driving home and we really wanted to meet him, but it just like, wasn't the time. Like, like the meet and greet was crazy and whatever. And we were at, we we pulled off in the most random, I'm telling you the most random, like stop off ever from like, it was in between Atlantic city and where we lived in New York. And we're just sitting there and I just see Johnny and his entire tour, like walk through the doors of like this rest stop. And we got to like eat with them for a minute and like hang out and like actually like talk to someone that we really idolized. And it wasn't a long moment. They just like shared a few fries and a few anecdotes and then went on their way. But it was like, I don't know, like this a confirming moment. And those things kept happening like I've met a lot of my heroes and they've never disappointed me. And I, um, like all, I'm trying to think of like another, there's so many times when I've been in a very random place and met someone I really, like I met Robert Plant, uh, who is the, for the youngins is the lead singer of Led Zeppelin. If you don't know that band, then just get out of the room anyway. But, uh, but I was like in Rockefeller center and we bumped, we literally ran into each other. And then I didn't, you know, couldn't find words really, but it was just like the universe being, that's actually a great story that has many parts, but it all is in me embarrassing myself. And we never got to connect because I just embarrassed myself. But anyway, whatever you, we all get starstruck once in a while, but I took it as like, in one day I ran into him twice once I physically ran into him and the second time I was going to lunch and I was like 
coming around the corner to go to this like table I always sat at every day. And he was sitting at that table. And I just like took it as like a sign of like, you're meant to do this. You know, so those are like, those are like, I would think like the highlights for me, not so much like who I personally worked with, because that, that doesn't feel like more like a highlight than it's like more of like achievement, you know? But I guess like, and then lows, mm, I feel like the only lows I've ever had are industry people who have tried to assert power or have wanted to do what I was doing and ended up shifting into the business side because they didn't make it and they're just sour. I've had a lot of that. Uh, I think the like worst experiences I've ever had in the industry though, honestly, are like the gig where you're like playing in a loud bar and nobody's listening and you feel like, why am I trying so hard? That, that crushed me more than like a bad interaction with somebody or like meeting somebody that didn't go well. Yeah. I know that's not like the answer maybe to the right, the like right answer to that question, but like no, no, no. my highs and lows are very different. I will say this though. You never know what's going to be like the, one of the best memories of your life. And like, I I always laugh because one of my most consistent gigs was actually playing the bar, the like sidebar of a strip club. <laughs> and when wow. I tell you that, like, why the fuck was I hired? I will never understand. <laughs> because when I say that I've never written this happy song, like as an artist, I have not. And I like would play an hour a week at this strip club. And the, the, like all the strippers like loved me. Like they would come in on their break and like have a drink and like relax and like and like all, like some of the guys from the club would come over to like hang out. Uh, it, like the, the women were the women were clothed. You know they were just like either after their shift or whatever. But it was connected to the strip club, and and like they just loved my sad songs, and I made so much money because the guys were like still tipping like he, they I think that maybe they thought I would take my clothes off at some point. Like I don't know if they like were like, is this still a strip club? Is it a bar? And I'm like, it's a, a bar. But they're like handing me like twenty they're like putting twenties on the stage as I'm playing. And I'm just like, I'm not giving change. <laughs> like, and I'm not taking my clothes off. But I made so much <laughs> money at that gig. And I and you would think like that oh I couldn't have felt good and it was the best. Those women loved my songs. I loved playing for them. And the guys, for the most part, were super respectful. You know, and it's, you know, you just never know what gig is going to like keep you going. Like, I paid my bills for a long time. Those yeah. definitely answered yeah. the question. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have some interesting stories. Uh, yeah. You can't not in the entertainment industry. I mean, come on. Clearly, I'm in the wrong um, <laughs> industry. I mean, the most scandalous thing that we have is like, oh, you know, we're getting audited or something. <laughs> you know what? That's just scary. Thing is, that is that is scary. Actually, <laughs> yes, and that is very scary. I, I think like um, something I realized this year, and then maybe it's just a me thing, but I'll share it anyway. It's like I don't think everybody needs to have a career. I think it's okay to just have a job that pays your bills and you get to just spill the rest of your time and brain space with... I can't tell you how many times I've woken up and been like, God, what would it be like if I didn't have this burning, relentless passion for this stupid, awful, disgusting industry? <laughs> like, What would my life look like if my dream was honestly simpler like what if the mm. dream was just to be able to have a beach house for two weeks of the year and that's like what i worked on all year was to have money for the beach house for two weeks of the that would be such a different life and i think that most people in this world are not relentless enough to achieve what they think success is and not like grounded enough to be able to say, okay, but success could be also this. And if you can't have that type of mentality, and I'm not saying that you can't do great things in your life, but it's like, 
why the actual fuck would you put yourself through it if you aren't made for it and you could be super happy just supporting yourself with whatever job gives you the most free time and peace of mind? That's a good point. It's almost like people who are in this industry and continue to do it they really, really must believe in themselves or just must believe in the work that yeah, it's like torturous, right? I mean, it's, it's masochistic. Awful. It's like, it's like, it's like if you're at an amusement park and you actually like really don't like heights, but you love the thrill of the second half of the ride. The first half is miserable, but the second half of the ride is so fun. And you forget how bad the first half is. And you keep getting on the same ride thinking the first half will feel better after a while. And it doesn't. That's the music industry. You'll always get to the second half of the ride and it feels super good. And then you get conned into doing it all over again. But if you're not someone that can continuously get on that ride and and survive the first half of it over and over and over and over. Like if it's not something that like you, I 99% of the time find it really fun. Even the shitty parts. I'm just like puzzle. I got to fit like solve. If that's not your reality, if 90% of your journey is misery, get the fuck out of this industry. Play a bar once a week in your hometown, write songs for you, release them on Spotify, have a TikTok that you're expressing yourself every day and and making music just for you. Maybe it'll actually work out, but get the hell out of the industry if it's not happy for you. Yeah, it's like, why, why put yourself through this? Exactly. I know a lot of people are going to hate that when they hear that. But, but I, yeah, you're, but I think you're either made for it or you're not. And, 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 and honestly, like making it in the music industry has literally 0% to do with talent. Talent's like, it's like when you're making a cake, you can't make a cake without the batter. Okay, cool. But that's not the cake, right? That's like, that is the definition of the cake is that the cake is once a batter. Your talent, that is the batter. Cool. You're talented. Great. Most people on this earth are talented. Most people. And everybody came here to be exceptional at something, right? So that doesn't matter. Making it in this industry is like, who do you know? Are, do you get along with a certain group of people at a certain time? Are you persistent enough? Are you using your time wisely? Do you have the skills that are popular at the time? Are you willing to reinvent yourself over and over and over again? Do you have money behind you? If you don't have money behind you, are you able to support yourself enough to have enough free time to do it? It's like, it's like the biggest gamble of all time. I think people need to hear that from somebody who's seen like the ups and the downs and what well, seems like in your case, more downs than ups. But yeah. who's, despite that, you're still able to come out and tell people, you know, how the industry really is. and. Yeah, but you know, I didn't have to get back up after 2019. Like I didn't. And no one would have judged me for it. But I just I regenerate like Mario. Just give me like a second for the game to be over. I'll come back with five new lives. <laughs> if someone is listening that wants to be in this industry, and this is just my opinion, which honestly everyone has an opinion. And it's as meaningful as you decided it is. But my opinion is this. Stabilize your life. If you come from really difficult circumstances, I don't know that life because I didn't have, you know, money being thrown at me, but I grew up in a middle class. Like I had, my starting line was further ahead than other people's. So I can't speak to what it's like starting at literally the lowest of low. But I do know that even if you can only save a penny a a month, it'll eventually accumulate to what you need to do something in the music industry, whether it's like recording something or taking a trip to a music city or whatever it is. It's like 
take the timetable away and just work towards it. But while you're doing that, stabilize your life. If you're coming from bad circumstances or just hard circumstances, getting something that makes you independent and and in a place where you can like have financial stability, that's when you're going to create the most. Because if you're worried about your bills, you're not going to write the best songs. Now, some people will combat me on that and be like, um, and like say, desperation creates great art. Sure. But I think you can use desire and angst and also not be in financial turmoil. So it's like the drive and desire to want it is enough angst is what I'm trying to say. And you don't have to be a starving artist or suffer to make it happen. If you are somebody who can't create unless you are suffering, my advice is to go to therapy and then find new tools to tap into old (laughs) wound, but not be continually wounded. But that's a whole other discussion. And you know, that's also just my opinion. Um, But yeah, stabilize your life and take the timetable off the, off the, table because if there's not a time constraint on it and you can make it whenever you're supposed to make it then you can save when i when i was living in nashville i didn't say this i've said this in other interviews before but like i was told in like 2014 that they weren't um signing any people that didn't build demos or tracks and so i couldn't afford um studio equipment at the time. And I saved my money from 2014 and I couldn't afford it till 2017. And I, and if I had just been at the end 2014, if I had said, Oh, I'm never gonna be able to afford that. I can't, I can't even imagine affording it. Then I would have been right. I would never have saved for it and I would have never afforded it. But I saved sometimes a lot and sometimes it's like literally 50 cents. But every month I put something towards it. And in 2017, I was able to buy the equipment. And then I had to take two years to learn how to like actually put a decent sounding demo together. But now I can actually make a, a demo from a session so that if there's not a producer, we could still do the session. You know? And, and so it's like being gentle with yourself of like, if that's how you have to make it, then I'll get there. But it might take five years or three years or 10 years, whatever. So I guess the advice is that 20 actually said something brilliant to me when we were doing the podcast. She was like, um, the only person waiting for this is us. Like nobody knows about us. We don't have fans right now. So can you stop killing yourself to get this out and just like get it out when it's ready? You know, thank you for sharing your story, you know, telling us, you know, all the struggles. I'm I'm sure that's not easy, you know, kind of being mm-hmm. vulnerable to the internet or just just vulnerable. Um yeah. And, yeah. So. Well, we're the first generation that's talking about things, period. You know? And so it's like if I can prepare someone from for the music industry, even though the industry has changed and it might not be what I what my industry was like i i'm just trying to be as open as possible thanks for having me <laughs> no yeah. i mean it was great yeah thank well, you yeah. Yeah. we'd like to thank ariel for sharing her story and journey with us hopefully her story inspires aspiring singers and songwriters on how to navigate the music industry. You can check out her music anywhere and her podcast Breaking Through is on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. So that's going to do it for this episode. As always, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow and subscribe on Twitter, Instagram, we're even on TikTok. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. See you then.